going to sing the rest of our songs at the end. First Timothy chapter 6. Wednesday nights we've been looking at uh, the, the theme of the fight of faith. The fight of faith. And uh, we've seen that when you get saved, it puts you right in the middle of a fight. <laughs> uh, you know, there's peace and there's, there's all the blessings of, of God. But what you've done is you've said, I'm on the Lord's side. And God has an enemy. <laughs> And we saw that the enemy's goal is to spoil us. The world, the flesh, and the devil, they, they want to ruin us from being effective for the Lord. And uh, there's a real battle to maintain moral purity. There's a battle to maintain doctrinal purity. And uh, for 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, sometimes we have to run. 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. You can look back later and see some of the things. He talks about different sins and, and he talks about uh, you know, money that we talked about this morning. Flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Uh, sometimes we have to run. Uh, you, you remember Joseph in the Old Testament? That lady grabbed him. He left his coat and he ran. Uh, particularly with, with moral things. You need to run away from immorality and run to the Lord. But sometimes we have to stand in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. And particularly, I think this applies to uh, doctrinal things. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. There are quite a few verses there where he talks about standing. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, we need to stand on God's word. Uh, we need to stand on, on the things that we, we know from God's word are right. Sometimes you'll have to stand alone. Well, you feel like you're alone sometimes. But if you stand with the Lord, you and God make a majority. And that's important. Uh, we need to understand that uh, there's a time to run away from immorality. There's a time to stand because of uh, of God's Word and so on. Tonight I want to talk to you about something else. That's about, what about when we fall? What about when we, we fail? You see, repentance is part of the Christian life. Uh, we know repentance is part of salvation. Uh, we've been looking at Acts chapter 20, how that you know, we're testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, for a person to be saved, they have to combine faith and repentance. They've got to deal with sin, but the only way to deal with sin is by faith in, in Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, Jesus, we, we often look at these, uh, we call them the Great Commission. And uh, for some reason, Matthew and, and Mark are the most commonly used. But Jesus and Luke, in giving the Great Commission, said that we need to preach repentance. He said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. We need to pe preach repentance and remission of sins. In um, 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, God tells us that we, we need to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, he, he talks about how he's not slack. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So repentance is, we know it's part of salvation. We know it's part of of life as we stand before God, and Christians have to deal with, with repentance. Now, the last message in this series, uh, we looked at temptation. Temptation is part of the battle as well. In uh, we've got lots of verses here, I'll, I'll try to get to as many as I can. First uh, Thessalonians 3, 5, just listen to it. He says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He said, I'm really praying for you. I'm you know, really on your side. I'm wanting God to, I want you to know God's word because the tempter is going to come. Temptation comes. And Christians are tempted to sin. You know, in 1 John, he talks about uh, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Uh, listen, those affect Christians too. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read the book of, books of Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians. They were Christians. They were tempted and they were people that sinned and had to, had to deal with that. You know, God intends for us to resist temptation. Uh, he said, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. 
will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. Uh, in 1 John 2, he says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Yeah, God it, it expects and wants us to deal with temptation by resisting it. But sometimes we sin. Right after he makes that statement, sin not, he says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, the battle first is with temptation. But when we sin, then the battle is, when will we repent? When will we deal with that? When will we change our mind? That's what repentance means. When will we say, Lord, I'm, I'm wrong? Confessing our sins is, we get confused sometimes, I think, by religion, where we have to do penance. We have to pay for our sins. Listen, Christ paid for our sins. We can't pay for our sins. And we should be sorry for our sin, but particularly we need to agree with God. That's what confession means. It means to agree with God. Lord, I was wrong. We'll see that more as we go on tonight. Um, there, there's, there's sin that can come into our lives as Christians. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and uh, verse 21. I've, we're only going to look at that one verse right now, but I mentioned the Corinthians earlier. There's some things in, that in life you don't want to be a good example of. And uh, the Corinthians, unfortunately, are a good example of a church that had a lot of sin in it. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 21. He's talking about coming to see him. And uh, verse 20, I, I fear when I uh, lest when I come I shall find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. Now, verse 21, lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness, and fornication, and lasciviousness which they've committed. <clears throat> he's talking to a church there. And he's saying, uh, boy, when I come, I, I sure hope this is not going to be the case. That you've not dealt with these sins. That you've, you've not repented. Uh, sometimes Christians need to repent because of sin in our life. Sometimes we need to repent as a church. You, you might have read in Revelation where uh, he says to the church at Ephesus, remember from whence the, therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. That was written to a church. You know, there was a church that had gotten away from the, the primary things of, of, of the Word of God. Well, tonight I, I wanted to give you some illustrations from Scripture. I'm afraid most of them are bad illustrations, but uh, let's start in, in chapter 4. And I'm not saying by using these people as illustrations that they were particularly Christians, but um, when we get to heaven, I guess we'll find out. The first one is a man named Cain. He was actually the first child born, as far as we know, and uh, Cain or Abel probably were probably twins. I think Cain was probably the first one out, but uh, he was born at... Before that, Adam and Eve had just had been created. They, they hadn't been born. So Cain and Abel, first ones born into a sin-cursed world. And uh, in Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel bring offerings to the Lord. And God honors Abel's offering. And he doesn't, he says the Lord, end of verse 4, had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Cain did not bring the offering that God had spelled out for him. I, I believe God had told them what to bring. I don't think God was just depending upon their having some kind of a sense of, of, of what to do. And God spoke to him. The Lord said unto Cain, verse 6, Why art thou wroth? Why hast thou countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? See, God calls him to repentance. And then God warns him, If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the, at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Uh, he's basically saying there, if you don't do right, sin is waiting to eat you up, eat you alive. Well, he, he ignored God. If you know the, the account that God gives us, he not only didn't repent, he went out and killed his brother. You know, if, 
If you don't like the competition, kill it. You know, God accepted Abel's offering and he rebelled against God and sinned more. And then he complained about the consequences. Man, verse 13, Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. You know, that's one of the characteristics of sin. It separates. And uh, uh, Cain did not repent. Cain did not follow what the Lord had said, both in the first case and then when he'd done wrong and God gave him opportunity. God is so gracious. And his sin affected many others. As he went out from the presence of the Lord, in verses 16 and 17, he built a city. And there's a whole city of people under his influence. Now, that's what sin is like. So we see in, in Cain, uh, that's not how we want to deal with sin. The next person that, that came to my mind was Esau. And uh, Hebrews chapter 12 gives us the account that I want us to look at. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Interesting how we usually say Jacob and Esau. Esau was the older, older brother. Esau and Jacob, I guess. Um, Hebrews chapter 12. Let me start reading in verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know that, for you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now here's Esau. Now, do you understand his situation? He was the first son. God had blessed him. He had a birthright. That's the only way he could trade it away is because he had it. God had, had blessed him. Uh, God had grace available to him. That's what he's saying there in verse 15. Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Uh, when he gives the illustration, that's, that's what he's giving it from. Esau was a person who failed of the grace of God. He was careless and thoughtless with what God had, had done for him. And he chose bitterness and fornication and worldliness over repentance. That's, that's what he's saying there in, in verse 15. A root of bitterness springing up. Now, lest there be any, verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. And, uh, you know, he, he was so careless that he traded away God's blessing, the Bible says here in verse 16, for one morsel of meat. Just for a quick meal. I'm, I'm about to die from hunger. Well, we all probably have said that at some time. Uh, but he, he, he lost that particular blessing forever. Uh, don't think God is saying here that uh, you reach a place where you can't be saved. You can't repent and be saved. But there's blessings in life that God gives you. Listen, you can throw them away. Uh, and this was one. God had given him uh, the birthright. He traded it away. And no matter how sorry or you know, what he did, he wasn't getting that, that birthright back. Uh, there's things we lose. And his sin affected many others. That's what God is saying there in verse 15. Uh, let, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And again, that's what happened with Esau. Uh, is it the Edomites that, that came out from Esau? A whole tribe, a whole nation of people uh, that came because of and through his, his rebellion. So we see Cain, we see Esau. Let me give you a, a couple, two more. Uh, Saul. Remember Saul, the first king of Israel? Go to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. And one of the things I noticed as I began to look at these different men was how much God had blessed each one of them. I mean, each one of them. God had just blessed them beyond measure. Cain, Esau, and here's Saul. You know, he, the Bible said he stood head and shoulders above everybody. He was, he was a massive, big man. He, would have, he was smart. He was... He was capable, and God blessed him. He made him the king. I mean, what more could he, could he ask? Well, he asked a lot more. But in 1 Samuel chapter 13, they, they had the Philistines. They're, they're the constant enemy, aren't they? Uh, that were threatening to come against them in battle. And uh, Saul felt like they needed to make an offering. And he'd sent for Samuel. Um, well, Samuel was delayed. 
for whatever reason, Samuel didn't come. And so Saul decides he'll make the offering. Now, you can disagree with me on this, but I believe Saul was using God like a good luck charm. A lot of people do that with their religion. It's like, well, I've been bad. You know, I need God to bless me, so I better go to church a lot, or I better give this, or I better do that. Or Listen, that's not the way it works with God. You don't bargain with God. And so Saul, instead of waiting for Samuel, who God had ordained to do the offerings and so on, he does it. And Samuel arrives. It sounds like just as, as they're doing it. And in verse 13, he says, Samuel said to Saul, that was done foolishly. Uh, this was a foolish thing to treat God in this way. And he began to make excuses. Verse 11, uh, you know, Samuel's first words were, what hast thou done? By the way, that's a good way if, if you're a parent dealing with your children. You never ask your kids why they did something. Say, what did you do? And that's exactly what Samuel does. And like kids will, uh, Saul begins to make excuses. He said, because I saw the people were scattered from me, and thou camest not within the day appointed. And, you know, basically saying, Samuel, it's really your fault. You should have been here. And, uh, and then down at the end of uh, uh, verse 12, where is it there? He said, I forced myself. Can't see it here. Oh, there it is. In, toward the end of verse 12. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Uh, listen, here was something he did that was, that was just wrong. And it affected many others. Verse 14, Samuel says to him, Now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought a man after his own heart. The Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. Uh, it affected Israel, affected him, affected his family, and so on. He was very foolish. But he didn't repent. Well, there's another time in, in Saul's life, 1 Samuel 28, when things are not going too well. God hasn't worked very well as a good luck charm, so he goes to a witch. Now, Saul was famous for being against witches. That's one of the things the witch says. It's 1 Samuel 28. So now he tries a different good luck charm. He's going to go see if maybe, maybe this witch can do something. And in, he's trying to cover himself. Verse 8 of chapter 28, he disguised himself and put on other raiment, trying to cover his sin. Verse 9, she says to him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? She said, you're, you're trying to trick me so that Saul will, will kill me. Well, uh, Saul was, was being a hypocrite, ignoring his own device. And there's lasting, continued consequences because of it. In verse 19, Moreover, the Lord will deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. Uh, he said, this is going to affect all Israel, and you and your sons are going to die tomorrow. Uh, Saul is a terrible illustration of a person who could have had God's blessing, but would not repent, would not deal with sin. The last one I want you to look at is in 2 Samuel 11, and that's David. It's well known that, that David had a time in his life when he committed sin with Bathsheba. That's found in 2 Samuel 11. Um, it's a, it was a time, the Bible says, that when kings go forth to battle, and David didn't go forth to battle. And uh, he, goofing around at the palace, I guess, and uh, sees this woman and decides he, he's going to have her. And he does. And then she sends word that she's with child, his child. And uh, so David begins to try to cover his sin. If you know the story, he sends the husband, uh, uh, he asks, has the husband come back so that he'll think it's his child. When he, he's so honorable, he won't even go into his wife. Uh, he sends him into battle and he tells the, uh, the commander, put him into battle where he'll get killed. One thing leads to another. You know, that's the problem with sin. It takes you further than you want to go. It just, uh, it's just a hideous thing. And many people were affected. In chapter 12 and, uh, and verse 9, he said, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. 
Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. You, you notice the expression God uses there? You've despised me. See, that's the problem with non-repentance. Instead of valuing God and His standards and His opinion, we treat Him like He's nothing. If you've ever been treated like that, you get a, just an inkling of, of what we're doing. Uh, uh, he says, I'll raise up evil against thee, in verse 11, out of thine own house, and, and so on. It affected many, many people. You know, you can go through the Bible and see so many illustrations of, of not repenting. Uh, people making excuses. People trying to cover their sins. Uh, people blaming others. Uh, some just open rebellion. You know, God will say, this is the word of the Lord. They say, I'm, I'm not going by that. Some blame God. Many ignore God. Uh, as I looked at some, just these few people, I, I noticed some common denominators. I noticed that in, in every case, other people are affected by our sin. Like he said in Hebrews, lest any root of bitterness spring, spring up and thereby many be defiled. Uh, sin doesn't just affect us. The other thing I notice is God gives opportunity to repent. Uh, each one of these people had, had the opportunity uh, to repent. I notice as well that sometimes what's lost can never be reclaimed. You know, there's just things that, that uh, once, once you've gone that route... Uh, it, it just, you can't go back. And the other thing I noticed was, in every case, no matter how it's expressed, there was regret. Remember Cain? Boy, he, he regretted it. He regretted the consequences. Esau, man, it made him miserable. Saul. But the thing is, repentance is different than regret. This is a really important spiritual truth here. Repentance is different than regret. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. God just spells it out here. I mean, he, he makes no bones about it. Very clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Like, been talking to them about their sin and dealing with it and so on. How he's made them sorry by writing to them. And he says in verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. See, there's regret. The sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, every week, or probably every day, there's people who commit suicide, uh, who you, you know, do terrible things. That's the sorrow of the world. That's regret. That's not repentance. There's hope in repentance. But not in regret. I had a, I'm sure this is one of these stories that my wife says, I tell the same ones over and over, but uh, when I was first in the ministry, I was, I was a young man. I had hair. And uh, the church I was at had a school. And uh, being a young man, they, they had me help with the uh, gym class, you know, sports. And we were doing some sport. I don't even remember what it was. And I, I blew the whistle on some kid, third grader. He didn't like my call, and he attacked me. I mean, literally. He came at me. He, he was going to have me. He's only about up to my waist. So I just tucked him under my arm. We headed for the office. Well, he was very sorry. He told me the whole way how sorry he was. He'd never do it again. But I'll guarantee you, if he'd been a head taller than me, he'd have beat the tar out of me. He wasn't repentant. He was just sorry that he got caught. And you know, that's, that's a lot of time the way we are. We're sorry for the consequences. Man, Cain was sorry for the consequences. Lord, it's more than I can bear. Well, you should have thought about that before, Cain. Have a heart for God. Same with Saul. God says, I'm looking for a man with a, with a heart for me. Saul, that could have been you. You know, in our lives, we, we need to be so careful. We... I mean, how, do I really have to explain that it's wrong to despise the Lord? I mean, that, that should just make sense to anyone, shouldn't it? And as Christians, uh, we just cannot despise the Lord and expect to know His, His blessing. Now, there's the battle of temptation. And, and you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. Uh, as time goes by, hopefully you'll be winning more than you lose. But when you lose, 
Then the battle is, how soon will you repent? How soon will you really change your mind and look to God for the forgiveness that, that only He offers? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the thing that encouraged me in this was David did repent. I've given you some terrible examples, I'll be honest with you. But in, in 2 Samuel 12 there, when, when God sends his man, he sends the preacher to talk to David. You know the story. And shared a story with David about a man who'd done a terrible thing. And David was so angry, he said, that man should be killed. And Nathan points his hand at him and he says, David, thou art the man. Can you imagine the, David's heart as he understood exactly what God was saying to him? I, I don't guess we can but you know what David said then to Nathan in chapter 12, verse 13, I've sinned against the Lord. Cain could have done that. Esau could have done that. Saul could have done that. David did it. Folks, there's hope for us. We can repent. God can change our hearts. He was accused by Nathan. He repented. As a result, he wrote the words of Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to my loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For my sin ever before me against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou might be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Against thee, thee only, he said, have I done this evil in thy sight. David understood the nature and consequences of his sin. David did not despise the Lord in his repentance. David repented, and so can we. Repentance is a change of direction. The book of Acts, he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Then I think the next phrase is something like, so that we can enjoy the, the blessings of the Lord in, in a King James Version. Uh, repentance is a change of direction. It's confessing our sin. It's forsaking our sin. It's turning to God. Repentance is toward God. Not just sorry for the consequences. Listen, everybody's sorry for bad consequences. That doesn't make us godly. It's sorrow toward God. It's understanding that our sin, you know, if, if there was no God, there'd be no sin. We could do what we wanted. It doesn't make, evolution doesn't make sense that we abide by rules. Who are you to tell me what to do? I might be more involved than you are. But when there's a God, there's a standard. There's a right and there's a wrong. And our sin is against Him. Our sin is against Him. In, in 1 John, he says, if we say we have no sin, we lie <laughs> and do not the truth. But then he gives us a great encouragement. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he reminds us, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word's not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And what a blessing. He's the forgiver. He's the, the sacrifice. He's the, the one that we go to uh, when we're sorry for our sin, when we agree with God. You know, it's best to be sorry before we sin. You, you might not have known that. We all know that, don't we? It's best to be sorry before we sin and, and resist the temptation. But when we fail, then the test, then the battle is, how soon will I repent? Do it soon. Do it sincerely. Do it every time. Don't try to deserve God's forgiveness. Listen, you never have, you never will. There's, there's no standard of living you can, you can maintain that will cause you to deserve God's love or forgiveness. God gives it because of His character, not ours. As many as I love, He said in Revelation 3, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Listen, God's Holy Spirit will, will poke us and say, you've, you've done wrong. That's said, repent. God might send a preacher. That preacher might be you. It might be me. And say, you're the man. Repent. 
Repentance. It's part of the battle of faith. It's, I have no parts of this battle that I particularly like. And this is not my favorite. But it's part. And uh, we need to fight the battle of repentance. Uh, we need to deal with, with sin when it's in our life. Let's uh, just take a, a few moments and uh, spend some time uh, with the Lord. Maybe you need to talk to the Lord about something. And uh, then I'll, we'll have a word of prayer. We are so grateful for your forgiveness. Lord, of, in all the universe, you're the one who knows us, everything about us, and you love us, and you offer forgiveness. Lord, that, that our sins are, are cleansed if, if we're saved. We're so grateful. But Father, we want to be right with you. Uh, don't let the spoiler spoil us. Father, help us to, uh, to be quick to confess and, and quick to turn. Now, Lord, help us not to be so quick to condemn others, uh, but be quick in our own hearts when your Holy Spirit speaks to us and your word convicts us. Thank you, Father, for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for your kindness, for your long suffering. And Lord, as we sang tonight, we, we look, so look forward to being with you and seeing you and being like you. And uh, Father, this battle that you put us in, we're so grateful that you've already won the victory. We thank you and praise you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing a, a few songs. Uh, we're going to start with number three, um, I'm sorry, 534.